Welcome everyone. Good, good morning, good evening, namaste, assalamu alaikum. All of you, depending on the time zone in which you live, because there are always people in this meeting from all over the world. I am Shakira Mohammed of Trinidad and Tobago, a teacher for the past 14 years. And this is the 133rd edition of our Zoom public meeting. We wish to sincerely thank all those who have contributed in whatever way to the success of this ongoing Pan-Indo-Caribbean and Pan-Indian Diaspora Global Project. For 132 unbroken continuous weeks, we have been here every single Sunday. In the past two years, eight months and three weeks, we have featured over 448 presenters from all parts of the world speaking on 132 topics. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a weekly forum being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center, which is a legally registered research and publishing company operating since 2010. In order to continue this weekly program and to make it bigger and better, we are asking that you kindly give us your suggestions as well as donations, and you can contact Dr. Kumar Mahabir for further details. As a note, Fiji just had their job elections on the 14th of December 2022 and the two major parties got 36 seats each. However, a declaration of victory depends on so three smaller groups and that depends on which group the major group they decide to join. Ladies and gentlemen, our moderator for this afternoon or tonight is Shalama Mohammed, the co-director of this Zoom platform, who is a business teacher and researcher from Trinidad and Tobago. She obtained her master's degree in business psychology from Franklin University in the USA. She's a strong advocate for health and wellness practices based on traditional and alternative healing. Shalama, welcome. Please take over from here. Thank you very much, Shakira. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Namaste and a very warm welcome to all of you. I wanna thank you very much for choosing to spend this part of your Sunday or your Monday morning with us especially because we have so much to celebrate today. We are alive and very, very happy to have witnessed Lionel Messi finally winning a FIFA World <laughs> Cup. A well-deserved victory for the Argentinian team. And I want to say congratulations on behalf of all of us to Argentina, as well to Qatar for hosting an incident-free series of World Cup matches. Our topic today deals with crime and more specifically, we reflect on ourselves in the Indian diaspora. So we want to examine the relationship between ethnicity and violent crimes in Guyana, South Africa, and the wider Indian diaspora. As is normally the case, our meeting should not exceed two hours. And our topic is, are Indians in the diaspora mainly the perpetrators or victims of violent crimes? A violent crime is defined as an incident in which an offender or perpetrator uses or threatens to use harmful force upon a victim. The crime may be violent by nature, such as murder, assault, rape, or assassination, or violence may be employed for the furtherance of another criminal act, such as robbery or extortion. Very little has been discussed or documented about Indians in the diaspora as either perpetrators or victims of violent crimes. One exception is in Guyana. With the murder rate in multiracial Trinidad and Tobago climbing to an historic and alarming 585 and counting as of today, where do Indo Trinidadians stand? Is data being collected on race and crime other than the cases of gang violence in which black on black killings predominate? The statistics that do exist can reveal some unexpected facts. Mixed race or Dogla boys, for example, are disproportionately overrepresented in criminal activities, as has been found by social scientist Professor Selwyn Ryan and his team of researchers. It is imperative that official crime data be collected for home invasions and robberies in which Indians are suspected to be the main victims. As is normally the case, we feature a panel presentation followed by questions and answers. And I just want to remind everyone to avoid trolls invading our program, our IT manager, Robin Ram Singh, has muted everyone. Speakers are advised not to admit anyone, not to unmute anyone, and not to allow anyone to share their screens, please. Thank you. 
So ladies and gentlemen, let me now introduce you to our first distinguished speaker. And this is Mr. Marlon Padayaji of South Africa. He is the CEO and founder of Map Media Green Gold Consulting. He's an alumni ambassador for the City University of London and a media strategist, publisher, and journalist. Welcome, Mr. Padayaji. Go ahead, please. You'd have to unmute your mic. Hmm, I wonder if we have, okay. So okay, I'm, I'm back with you. Can you hear me? We're hearing you now, go ahead. All right. And thanks to the host and thanks to all of you for this opportunity. Um, are Indians in the diaspora mainly the perpetrators or the victims of violent crimes? Well, I'm speaking from a country where crime is dispro disproportionately very high. Two horrific incidents, or even a myriad of incidents that stand out conspicuously could aptly define the split personality face of Indians in South Africa when it comes to the question of violent crimes. So come back to the question. So are Indians numbering 1.4 million of a populace of 62 million of mainly black, African black majority peppered with whites and colors, perpetrators of victims of violent crimes. Historically, they could be described as peacemakers or a belligerent brigade of troublemakers involved in intra-Indian and interracial violence. The straightforward answer, however, is that Indians do feature prominently in both the diametrically opposed dynamics of the scale of crime. They are perpetrators within their communal quarters and outside these quarters. On the flip side, they are victims as soft targets of petty to serious crime. And this, this trend took place, especially during a spike since the dawn of democracy in 1994. What are the horrific incidents that made the old nation stand up and stare at Indians. In 2021, during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic and South Africa's hard lockdown and health safety protocols, an Indian female whistleblower was assassinated. In the same year as the coronavirus gripped communities, an Indian drug kingpin was killed by Itmen, deployed by rival drug lords. Single mother of a teenage daughter, Babita Dukaran, worked, worked as a chief financial officer in a government health department. She became a whistleblower and after she discovered a paper trail of tender and procurement deals did not add up, she got wind of irregular and dubious payments to politically connected black business elites. She blew the whistle on these common shenanigans that has plagued South Africa since freedom in the 1990s. A corruption weary nation has closed ranks and has rallied around this brave whistleblower who was silenced in August, 2021 while her, while her hired killers faced charges in the courthouse. Members of parliament are expected to legislate in the new year on whistleblowing as a deterrent it could possibly be called the Babita Dukaran law. And then in one of the most terrifying incidents in Durban, a notorious gang, gang drug kingpin, Yaganathan Pile, nicknamed Teddy Mafia, was killed by two shots fired at a point blank range at his head near his home. Quite outrageously, the angry henchmen beheaded the suspected killers and burnt their bodies on the street as helpless victim, as helpless police watched. One of the most gruesome incidents captured and posted on social media platforms and replayed on national TV. It brings you to the 162 years of Indian presence in South Africa. This community continues to experience a double-edged sword syndrome with crime and violent behavior versus victimhood. In the draconian days of the apartheid era when police enforcement and law and order was stringent as an extension of the white Africana regime's iron fisted and vice like grip over the disenfranchised people of color. Then there was a zero tolerance policy towards crime in all, all its forms, 
or the sl slightest spark of rebellion, resentment, or dissent was met with brute force and harsh prison sentences. Decades since the birth, since the 1860s, birth of the biggest Indian population outside <clears throat> mainland India, a generation of these semi-slave laboring classes and market gardeners soon graduated into gangs and gangsters. From, 19, from, 19, from the 1940s to the 1970s, Indians, Indians were aggressively involved in organized crimes and gang wars and terrorized peaceful people. This tendency was born mainly out of apartheid's tough economic conditions and limited socioeconomic opportunities for Indians, poverty and poor housing and community recreational facilities. In Durban, the biggest concentration of Indians, Indians teamed up with the Creolized colored community in engaging in gang wars, extortion of Indian-owned businesses, illicit liquor and drug trading, running prostitution rings, smuggling of shipped goods, monopolizing metered taxi routes and fraud and corruption. So there was a whole scenario of this kind of criminal elements. However, in the 1990s, Indians like the rest of the nation plagued by racism and state-sponsored violence, intimidation and harassment were put at ease by the new wave of freedom. While political reforms and socioeconomic conditions had roundly benefited the country, the scourge of crime became rooted and rerouted the rainbow nation into the dark clouds of violent crimes. An influx of economic migrants from Africa triggered, dead, triggered a deadly and new wave of violent crime, ranging from cash in transit, ICE murders, assassinations, to horrifying home invasions in which Indians too were hijacked out of their motor vehicles, some shot in their driveways, and others attacked in parkades. As victims, Indians have joined the call for the reimposition of the apartheid death penalty something that the ruling governing ANC party deemed vehemently opposed to as non-negotiable and politically incorrect. South Africa is ranked in the top 10 global listing of countries with the highest crime rates, also classified by the United Nations. Papua New Guinea trails Venezuela as a first and second notorious crime spot with Trinidad and Tobago at number six and Afghanistan at number four. South Africa, however, leads the world as a rape capital and records the highest number of gender-based violence against women and girls. Durban and the rest of South Africa kicked off with the United Nations, declared 16 days of activism of no violence against women and children on its back foot, with an alarming track record of thousands of rapes pitched at 62% this year, at plus domestic abuse and violence against women, men, and children, and a spike in other dangerous criminal activities, including carjacking and kidnapping. A crime-plagued a crime plagued nation is faced with 13,000 women victims of assault with intent to commit grievous bodily harm between July and September 2022. The police minister was repeated his controversial orders that the police must meet fire with fire named the Durban police stations as one of the top police precincts with the highest recorded rape incidents this year. The ministry says it says 1,277 women were victims of attempted murder, 989 women were murdered, and 10,000 dockets for rape cases were opened. Of the 8,227 rape incidents, 5,083, pegged at an alarming 62%, were committed at the homes of the victims or the perpetrators, while 1,651 rape incidents took place at public places like streets, parks, and beaches, and 69 were raped at abandoned and derelict buildings, and women and girls were raped on buses, taxis, trains, and other modes of transport. President Ramaphosa, Add this to say, this crisis of violence against women and children is a great shame on our nation. 
it goes against our African values and everything we stand for as a people. We grew up being taught that as men and boys, we must respect women and protect children. We were taught to never, ever raise your hand against a woman, but we have lost our way. The head of state said, our our com the head of state added, our communities are in the grip of violence against those we are supposed to protect. I invoke the memories of the many women and girls in this province and throughout the country who have suffered from the brutality of men. So far, in response to the high crime rate, the government has budgeted 16 billion rand to tackle gender-based violence head on. Indians in this diaspora remain in a catch-22 situation. The working class masses live in dormitory townships plagued, plagued with crime and intra-Indian killings and attacks. The wealthy are shielded in gated, gated townhouses and behind the eye walls of mansions. However, the incidence of Indians as victims outweigh, outweighs the collective image as perpetrators. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, in listening to you there, I was making a note that um, socioeconomic factors are directly correlated with the propensity to commit crimes. And um, we have some questions about what has happened to some of those gang members who were, as you said, in the 1940s to 1970s among the Indian population committing those crimes. So hopefully we should get some answers at the end. I want to thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we move on now to our second speaker and he's no stranger to us. We welcome Mr. Ravi Dev of Guyana. He's an Indian civil rights activist and former member of parliament in Guyana. He's also the former leader of ROAR, Rise, Organize and Rally. He's a former attorney at Law in New York City as well. Welcome, sir. Go ahead, please. You're still muted. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot again for having me back on this program after a bit of a hiatus. Good to see some old faces. Um, the question that is posed uh, that we are gonna attempt to at uh, answer are Indians in the diaspora, mainly the perpetrators or victims of violent crimes. Implicit in the question, of course, is that Indians are being contraposed against others uh, as to who's committing more violent crimes or not. And in our societies, it's a bit of a, a tricky question because uh, you know one can be accused of blaming, of playing the blame game uh, or playing the uh, victimhood game and all of that. So with that uh, in, in mind, I wanna be careful to point out that uh, we are all human beings and all human beings have a propensity uh, to become violent uh, after being frustrated or being thwarted or for various personal psychological reasons. So whatever I will say uh, does not imply that there's any one group that uh, per se is more inclined uh, towards uh, uh, violence. So, to start off my presentation, um, I turn to a Welsh sociologist, Howard Jones, who studied directly uh, for Guyana uh, this question. And uh, incidentally, I believe one of his researchers uh, was our esteemed um, colleague, Dr. Tara Singh, who is with us. And Dr. Jones published his book, uh, called Crime, Race, and Culture, a study in a developing country. And Jones reported, and I'll read this, of course, a summary. Data indicate that although East Indians are relatively more prone to commit violent crimes, I want to repeat this. Although East Indians are relatively more prone to commit violent crimes, they do so among each other. They do so among each other. Africans commit more crimes in total 
and against other groups. To speak then in the vernacular, as we say in Guyana, Indians are very violent, but only towards each other. We chop up each other with cutlasses uh, with great gusto, especially after bouts in the rum shops. Dr. Jones continued, Africans have earlier starts in their criminal careers and are more likely to recidivate, meaning to you know, be recidivists, they go back to crime, than Indians. So it becomes a pattern. Again, it implies that Indians may commit these violent acts spontaneously uh, much more, and it's not a pattern in, in, in their behavior. He goes on, broad differences in criminality between the two ethnic groups are paralleled by differences between their cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds. So his data, and maybe Taraji might be able to expand on this later, um, uh, he, he, there was some correlation uh, in the criminal behavior and their cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds. He continues, Indians are under strong pressure to accept traditional values of conformity and respect for authority, as well as suppression of aggressive tendency. And he adds parenthetically, which may contribute to explosive violent behavior. Here again, uh, we can then talk about Indian violent behavior that in a sense, they repress it and they turn it retroflexively upon themselves. And some have hypothesized this leads to violence on themselves, suicide, violence against their families, their children, and probably uh, go about kicking even the family dog. So it comes out of uh, what Dr. Jones is saying, a cultural tendency uh, not to act out, so to speak, implying that the other major groups, especially African Guyanese, are socialized to express their anger uh, uh, outwards much more prevalently. And note I use socialized, not in any way genetic or anything like that. So he, conclu uh, he concludes, he says, the family is at the heart of Indian culture and African family life, on the other hand, is scarred by its slave history, is emotionally deprived, unstable, marked by the frequent absence of any permanent father figure and characterized by the serial mating of parents. Behavior and role models are characterized by short run hedonism. I think, out, and this finishes uh, my summary of Dr. Jones's findings based on empirical data. Now, while this is a bit dated, as an individual uh, who um, is associated with the media group and uh, reviews every night. Uh, the, the, the entire newspaper, especially uh, the crime section, um, I can say that these insights are still extremely relevant to the violent behavior we see in Guyana today. And coming back to that and to the data, one of the problems we face in Guyana, and I suspect in many other third world countries, is the absence of data um, broken out ethnically so that while the police would have just released a finding that in the last year, serious crimes, including murder, decreased by 22%, we don't get an ethnic breakdown as to whether that was across the board or whether it is in one a particular ethnic group. So we really can say, and this is something that individuals like myself, and I know even Dr. Tara Singh, uh, we have been requesting that if we are to get to the bottom of resolving 
this uh, um, pattern of uh, violent behavior, we must go a little more granular because as Dr. Jones said, there are correlation between the culture and the behavior. And there needs to be the data to go further now to see if there's any causative factors apart from correlative factor. So um, I, going forward, while I may allude to some data, they'll be very broad because I, like I said, we don't have hard data. Take for example, um, the whole question of uh, what we now called um, uh, intra, what, um, it, um, your intimate partner violence. It's a new term, you know, we say uh, kill, wife killings and all of that. That is a tremendously uh, relevant and sad sco scourge that is um, the guy is going through. Just uh, two days ago, in my part of the country, there was a young female attorney, very, very brilliant, attached to the AG chambers. Uh, and she had a relationship with an individual from her area. He was uh, a barber. And uh, lo and behold, two days ago, uh, in a secluded area, he shot her, killed her, and then turned the gun upon himself and killed uh, himself. So this is something that um, we know has gone on uh, from since the Indians landed. So um, I don't want to make it, uh, you know, to say that it is a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but we can see some pattern be in, in some of these intra um, intimate partner relationships where uh, there's a social gap uh, between the two partners and uh, the feelings of inadequacy or what have you may come into play. And this takes us back to uh, the, 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 the crack I wanted to take was to look at our uh, pattern of violence um, uh, historically. And this makes me segue into the indentured era between 1838 and 1917, when uh, we were othered as being very docile for accepting the contract we had signed. And um, we were subjected to tremendous amount of violent repressions by the state police and all of that. But one fact we know was that only three women at the very best were brought in to every 10 men. And this precipitated what the media sensationalized as wife killings in Guyana, uh, as if Indians were more prone towards killing uh, their intimate partners. The numbers are there, yes, they were there, but as to what caused it, what was the causative factor, very few of them related it back to the um, imbalance between male, male and female. So what we see today in um, intimate partner violence has a long history in the, uh, the Indo-Guyanese community. Also, another aspect that comes out of that era is the violence by the state against the East Indian. From the very beginning, the, our civil contract to labor is a civil contract uh, uh, allowed the employer to have criminal penalties imposed. So violence could be used for simply not following the work. So when uh, at various occasions, uh, uh, our, our forefathers attempted to protest the planters violations of their contract in terms of working beyond seven hours, not being paid uh, properly as to what was the agreed rate and all that. There was a series of shootings in Guyana. This was the ultimate terror, of course. And so we are talking starting as early as 1872, 1896, 1903, 1912, 1913, 1924, 1939, and as recent as eight, nine, 1948. 
Indians were shot by the police. All they had to do was to read what they defined as the riot act. And in one case, use a Gatling machine gun to simply mow down 13 people at a place called Rosal. So that is the kind of violence our people were subjected to. And it is extremely interesting to note that as Dr. Jones pointed out, that violence was not turned out against themselves, outside of themselves, to go on a rampage and kill others. There is no record in all of Guyana's history, even though all of those individuals were shot, that Indians went out and opened fire on any other uh, villages or anything in quote unquote retaliation. So we talk about uh, the terror of the state. We talked about uh, the, the, the intimate partner violence. And what made that particularly relevant in the presence, in the present, in terms of violence was from the very beginning, there was a differential recruitment into the police force where the police force was over 99% African. The 1% uh, the were British white, British uh, officers. And therefore the individual shooting the Indians, when you look visually in what the Indian can see at an experiential level, his lived experience was that one set of people was shooting him down and that had to have some reverberations in his psyche because that percentage uh, at the very best uh, later uh, to this day might be 80, 85% uh, African Guyanese are mixed and maybe 10 or 15 at the very most are Indians in the police force. And as we know, uh, the police force is the arm of the state as defined by Weber that has the ultimate authority to inflict force. So when you have an institution that is legitimately, according to the law, allowed to use force, and they're all of one particular ethnic group in a divided society that uh, should be of concern. So I quickly move uh, to the pre-independence era when the Indians moved out of the sugar plantations. Uh, they still remain there as workers, but a, a, a half of them moved out to form their own villages and they began through rice and through cattle and through selling milk to develop an entrepreneurial class. And they began to be seen as having money because they had a notion from their culture of deferred gratification, of saving uh, their money. Uh, I grew up with my nanny. Uh, she was born in 1900. And I always remember her telling me that if we earn a, a dollar, you always save at least uh, 20 cents. You never ever spend a dollar if you earn a dollar. So the point is by the middle of the last century, Indians began to be seen as having money. They opened business uh, slowly to selling their cattle. They would have sent their son to college and what have you. And so by the time th that started, they began to be preyed upon whenever they came to Georgetown to do their shopping a phenomenon called choke and rob uh, develop. Uh, we Guyanese are very prone to a uh, very descriptive um, uh, not nouns, choke and rob, not mug. You know, a mug might be something you drink from. Choke and rob, you are literally choked and robbed. And Indians by the 50s and in the 60s, they became the primary victims of that violent crime because you were not only choked and robbed, but the choking could leave you to, to suffer um, all kinds of, of, of damage. So unfortunately in Guyana, and this is where it is one of the, re uh, the, the, how do I put it? The realities that we must confront that in Guyana, because of the beginnings 
of our society, almost any type of violence is imbued with politics. And I'm not talking only from Foucault's point that all relations are imbricated with power. I'm talking at a macro level as to how our society evolved, that because of the preponderance of African Guyanese in the state apparatus, the police, the army, the bureaucracy, we call it civil service. And because the Indians were now uh, in the professions, they weren't allowed to, to enter the state. They were always seen as easy prey. So if, a, if an Indian had a problem and goes to a police station, that police station was like a foreign land. You now would be humiliated in that police station uh, because the assumption is, why are you crying? You're already rich, you have money. So in the 60s, as the political struggle uh, between the two parties, which were part, uh, uh, you know, ethnically based, the, the, the violence, was used, the violence that was already there was used. So choke and rob became much more endemic to intimidate perceived Indian supporters of the PPP. So the, the, again, that nexus was strengthened between ethnicity and, and the kind of violence. Uh, during that era also, um, there was so, two terrible incidents which has marked our the, the how I put it, epitome of violence was that in 1964, um, after some two Africans were killed on the coast, there is the mining bauxite town of Linden at that time called Wisdom, uh, 65 miles in the interior. Uh, the killing on the coast precipitated a wave of murder, of rapes, and of wholesale ethnic cleansing, the first ethnic cleansing in this hemisphere. That was violence. 3,000 people were chased out and had to leave everything. And there was another incident that was Indians chased out, but a gra very grave incident, a ferry taking back passengers to Wismar, containing all African Guyanese, was uh, blown up and 43 Africans perished. So that, in a sense, became uh, almost a metaphor uh, since that time for race relations. So even though one may say it's over 60 years uh, later, it is still evoked and is still very evocative. So we come back now to the post-independence era, the dictatorship imposed by Forbes Burnham, where the, this was now a totalitarian state. And I'm using the word as used by Walter Rodney, our most eminent historian, world famous, that he created a totalitarian state where every institution was controlled. And part of a totalitarian state is to have a reign of terror. So you had in Guyana, again, very descriptively, something called, phenomenal called kick down the door bandits. These were individuals who many of them were from the police or the army, would surrender their guns or they themselves would kick down the doors of Indian, especially rural folks, brutally assault them because Indians were thought to have their money under their mattresses. And that was one of the most horrific reign of terror. In Guyana, they kicked down the door uh, banditry um, uh, even the, 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 the most foremost African rights activist, Yusi Koyano, said that that violence was so ethnically divided, and I'll quote him now, that it had a flavor of genocide. So that's the kind of violence that we had. So now when you have all that violence inflicted upon you and the Indian literally cannot respond because to respond would be to take on the entire armed forces that see you as an alien. That retroflexive anger continued. And we saw great violence, greater violence uh, by the Indian upon himself, where by the 2000s, 
uh, uh, Indians of Guyana. They say Guyana, but it's the Indians of Guyana have the highest suicide rate in the world. Suicide is violence. It's violence upon yourself. And um, so I want to tell you, we are, I want to conclude that after the dictatorship was ended, many people felt that this reign of terror would decrease, but it has sadly intensified because after free and fair elections were brought in in 1992, the PPP normal mode of trying to govern and the data shows that they spent the money equitably because when you measure by the UN uh, mandated uh, measurements of the rise out of poverty, African Guyanese did even better than indo guyanese both in absolute and relative terms. Yet the PPP was demonized for um, ethnic cleansing of afro guyanese and again, terror was unleashed. So from 1998, after the 1997 elections where the PPP won, violence started to such an extent that in one year, and that is where I enter politics to speak out, because in one year, 1998, 31 Indian businessmen were murdered, several kidnapped amidst so-called political uh, oppression. And that initial violence segued for the next decade when hundreds of people were killed because Indians were seen as targets. Five gunmen escaped from prison held up in an African village, openly called themselves um, uh, freedom fighters and wiped out entire families in neighboring Indian villages. In one case, in the neighboring village of Luziknan, 11 women, uh, men and children, children were shot at point blank range where their guts were uh, spilled out. And there were several other, um, uh, outrages uh, li like that. So that continued until they were wiped out. So this is where the Indian violence, because somebody got to do something about it. And from what we now know, those Indian business people turned to an Indian uh, drug dealer. And he had the guns, he had the mentality, and he had the wherewithal to hire people from within the police force and elsewhere. And Guyana became a, a killing field. So now we hear about uh, one newspaper between, uh, saw 432 individuals were killed of which 185 were Indians and the rest were Africans. There's now this inflated claim of thousands of Africans were killed, but be as it may, nobody mentions how this thing started. The individual as a drug dealer was interdicted in Suriname. He was renditioned, served 10 years in an American prison. And to be very frank about it, he is seen by many Indians, normal Indians as a hero because Indians were literally uh, didn't know what to do. And I will say it publicly here. I, as a party leader, the American ambassador at that time called me and says, well, how is the Indian gonna deal with this wave of violence against them. And David Hines, who is now the greatest uh, liberator, so to speak, he and I had lunch and he asked me the same question because Indians weren't seen as being capable of retaliating. So to conclude, I want to say that Guyana remains in a very tenuous state of violence. Yes, there's the everyday uh, violence that we will not uh, want to uh, dismiss is there. People get robbed, people get killed, there's intimate partner violence. But the greater danger is when you have the leaders of almost half of the country, the opposition, claiming that Guyana is becoming, an, and I quote, an emerging apartheid state, practicing economic genocide. Look to those words and what it is connoting it is connoting apartheid where you are making Africans 
beyond class, so low. Look at what happened in South Africa. We have South Africans in our audience here. And secondly, the word genocide, redolent of what happened in Rwanda. So you're having the community being told by these leaders that all will be lost. And very openly, we are saying that uh, there are calls for violence. And we saw, and this is my last statement, we saw just less than a week ago, an individual, a Nigerian, who was brought into Guyana just around our elections time in 2020, received a police clearance, received an invitation letter to get a job as a security person to have a weapon. And that person two years later tries to enter the home of our president and upon being denied, whips out a knife, stabs the guard, the presidential guard five times, seizes the weapon from a female uh, presidential guard and starts shooting. He was shot and we are hoping that he will live uh, to be questioned. But the point I wanna make is that this reign of terror upon the Indian in Guyana is far from over. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Rabidev. As always, a very analytical presentation. We thank you so much for sharing your well-researched facts and your thoughts with us. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, um, I wanna say thank you very much to both Mr. Marlon Padayachi and Mr. Rabidev for their time, their sacrifice, their effort and their expertise in addressing today's question. We are going to begin the question and answer segment. And I'll ask you, if you would like to pose a question, make a comment or a contribution, please raise your electronic hand in the reactions, but you just at the base of your computer screen. Only then would our IT manager, Robin Ram Singh, allow you to speak. So I know that we have um, a question from a very special guest today, Dr. Sajidin Chaparban, who is an assistant professor in the Center for Diaspora Studies at the Central University of Gujarat. So we will have him speak with us a little later on, but at this point in time, we'd like to invite him to ask his question. Welcome, Dr. Chaparban. Go ahead. Unmute, please. Hello. We're hearing very, you. Good morning from India. Namaskar. Salaamu Alaikum. I am very delighted to listen to uh, Dr. Ravi, sir, and uh, another uh, professor, Dr. Marlin. I think this was a wonderful presentation, and uh, I was wondering why there is a gap between the Caribbean scholarship on Indian diaspora and Indian scholarship on Indian diaspora. Uh, so I think uh, Indo-Caribbean Center is doing a wonderful job to connecting the Indian scholarships and the ongoing Caribbean scholarships on Indian diaspora. Coming back to my question, uh, sorry for taking extra time. Uh, this is question to Dr. Ravi, sir. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, was there any kind of political mobilization uh, during the colonial time? As in the case of, uh, we have seen in South Africa, there is a political mobilizations among the Indians like the Natal Congress and other initiatives that were taken place. So was there a similar kind of, you know, political mobilization in Guyana, sir? Oh, definitely. Um, the Indians after the abolition of indentureship in 1917, and the last indentured contract uh, expired in uh, 1920, by that time, we had already started to develop a middle class. Uh, we had sent several individuals who became doctors from the uh, University of Edinburgh. Uh, we had uh, several lawyers, a very famous family uh, produced several lawyers. And it's these, these things, um, you know, they are led from the middle class. Even Marx conceded that, um, you know, revolutionary movements start from the middle class. He being an uh, epitome of a middle class individual. The, the point is though that by the 1916, even before the abolition, something called the British Guyana East Indian Association uh, was launched. And while it was not a political party, it took up cudgels on behalf of the Indian uh, who were still mainly uh, from Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, 
uh, we are basically Bihari, I'm a Bihar from their Patna, um, so that uh, they took up that cause. And they, they, one of the early leaders of the PGIA, he accompanied the return ships uh, to India. So he made contacts in India. And in fact, looking very strategically, and this is the greatness of our indentured foreparents, they saw that if not to stop indentorship, if indentorship were to continue, because the lot, uh, tough as it was here, was better than in India, in Bihar, and still is, the point is that if more Indians were to come, the, when uh, in, if freedom came, they would be able to outvote. That was their strategic thinking. So several of them went to India, but Mahatma Gandhi was back then, and he argued against it. So two delegations have gone. So the point is, so answer your questions. Yes, there was political mobilization. There were political thinkers far ahead. Uh, in fact, um, one of them was very much like Subhash Chandra Bose, who uh, felt that Gandhiji did not see the strategic nature of, you know, looking that far ahead as to what would happen. Well, yes, it started as early as then. And there was a counter reaction from the other groups to the British Guyana East Indian Association. Thank you, sir. Thank okay, you, sir. Excellent. Great, thank you. So let's have our second question from Ms. Chand Gupta. Chand is originally from Fiji. She's a very good, very good friend of ours. And uh, she's living now in the US. Chand, go ahead, please. Unmute your mic. You can go ahead, ask your question. Can Chand put on her video? I'd like to see who's asking questions. <laughs> sure. Come on here, Chand. <laughs> I'm just talking to Ganesh Chand in Fiji right this minute. Let's see you. Let me see sometimes her connection could be a problem. Chand? We have no problem with her on the chat. Okay, I see you unmuted, but we're not hearing you as yet. Uh, I have the video on as well, so are you able to see me? No, but we can hear you. Go ahead, okay. then. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my question is to Ravi and also Sherry, and if both of them could uh, think about it and reply, uh, because uh, I see that Sherry is a lawyer and Ravi is an activist. So they and, 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 and the lawyer and the lawyer also New York. Oh, they, that's good. Okay, so you can answer first, and then Sherry Ann can also put in her views about my question. Okay, the reason I'm asking is this: that during the Girmit the Girmit period, the indentured laborers suffered a lot of violence from the Sardar, or they used to call them Columbers. And there was a lot of physical violence, and that is how the Columbus would control the indentured laborers. Now, could it be that because they were not able to retaliate against the Sardar, was it uh, a, like sort of a carry on to the violence among their own families and then amongst themselves? And could it be also a reason why that it, this violence continues to this day? Well, that is not a theory anymore. Um, in Guyana, the first uprising, it didn't lead to any deaths, was in, I, I, I returned to Guyana 30 years ago and I'm living on the plantation that my father mm -hmm. came out, out of the ranges. This house here is the, uh, you know, we came out. So I'm literally living uh, out of the logies and the, the, the sugar plantation is still spewing smoke, which I have to breathe in every day from the ashes. <laughs> Be as it may, uh, the next uh, plantation was called Plantation Leonora. Mm -hmm. And the first uprising started there in 1869, even before they had gone to Fiji. And the British, as they normally do, sent out a, com a royal commission. And one of the individuals that came along with the commission uh, from at that time, the, you know, the slave, the uh, abolition of slavery movement was still strong. They sent a, 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 what we would call a liberal lawyer, Jenkins. He came. And when he came, 
he wrote a very famous book, two books. One was a novel, Lakshmi and Dilu, the first novel about indentured uh, laborers. Mm -hmm. uh, he fictionalized their lives. But more importantly, he wrote a report on the condition of the coolies. And what he exposed was not only the Sirdar, there was a complete conspiracy overall by the colonial state in a one, two, three. So the, the one, one manager testified that the coolie could only be in one of three places. Either he's in the fields or he's in a hospital or he's in jail. Because remember, it's a criminal for violating. If you showed up late for work, it's a criminal offense. You could be jailed, believe it or not. Yes. So the, what he found and he wrote that the magistrate, because on paper, we could also reach a charge the, 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 mm. the, the overseer. But he saw that the magistrate would have lunch with the manager of the plantation. Yes. He would be allowed to sit next to the magistrate in court. So mm -hmm. as my friend Devanan Bhagwan would say, it is like trying, trying the devil in hell. Devanan being Christian believes in heaven and hell, a joke between us. But the point is very seriously, mm -hmm. Jenkins exposed this farce, right? And that was, and he was banished. Uh, for from then on, and a, a magistrate backed him, Divu, and Divu wrote a letter to a very important um, member of, of, of the British Parliament. So there were some reforms of that, but it continued. So come from, from the manager, mm -hmm. who would who could do what he wants, they would have brought out poor, got the poor Scots and Irish as overseers. And mm -hmm. these were never married. They would never bring them as married. It was young overseers. So they preyed upon the females. So a lot of these wife choppings was because the woman was forced to be with one of these, uh, the, the, these redneck from, from uh, Scotland and Ireland. And my nanny, who was born, like I said, in 1900, before the abolition of, of indentureship, she told me she worked in the back dam from the, uh, in the fields from the age of six. And she always tells the story of pre protecting her pretty young cousin against the, uh, you know, the, the, the attentions to be kind mm -hmm. of this overseer. So, yes, it was a whole system. And they all looked out for each other and they protected each other. And as a lawyer, let me just say this. At the mm -hmm. macro scheme, the law was made and it was called the change from any notions of what you call natural law, where you can argue about justice and freedom and all of that. The law became positivist. So the law was what the law says and you ain't going nowhere else. So they did everything from the top to the bottom. They had you literally bound. And that is why we are called bound coolies. We were bound. Yes, totally. But the thing is that uh, because of the ratio of a hundred men to forty women, when they came in indenture, because I recently read the book by Kotaram Sanadhyaya, who was indentured in Fiji, and he spent twenty-one years yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he talks about a lot of violence, like the kind that you have described. But also what I'm looking at is the violence within the Indian community. Well, you see, like you're, the you're, you're eliding the cause. Mm -hmm. You're looking at the proximate cause and not the ultimate cause. Mm -hmm. The star is merely reflecting what the overseer is doing. Yes. The overseer is merely reflecting what the plantation representative is mm -hmm. doing. The plantation representative is re reflecting what the West Indian lobby in the House of Commons. We are the person who imported the first lot, mm -hmm. not far from me uh, in Reading Hoop. His mm -hmm. son went on to be the prime minister of, 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 of England, Gladstone. So you're talking of a whole network. So when you yeah. now, and we still do that, we blame the Indian. I know I'm not gonna excuse any Indian, uh -huh. but for example, today there's a joke in Guyana if you face an Indian policeman, he'll give you a harder treatment than the African policeman. Why does he do so? Because he's a minority. He has to go along. He is in an institution where 90% of the, 
are of the other group. So he tries to prove his loyalty. So again, accepting this is happening, but let's look at the actual mm. causative factors, not just the proximate ones. Uh -huh. So this vicious cycle just keeps on going. In Guyana, at least still today. Because yes, in Fiji also. The same the thing is going is on. The same here. Yes. So, so, Chan, we have to talk about it from a psychological perspective. Yes. Yeah. That's so, I want, to, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your question. I'm seeing Devanand Bhagwan waiting very patiently to ask okay. his question as well. So, let's hear what he has to say to this. Go ahead, please. Mr. Bhagwan, you need to unmute. Yeah, hi. Um, um, Namaskar ji, assalamu alaikum. Um, again, uh, Ravi ji, I wholeheartedly salute you for all the all, all what you've done for the Indian community over the past uh, decades. Uh, you're remarkable. You've touched on uh, quite a few uh, important points. However, I'd like to zero in on this police composition, this police lack of uh, Indian representation in the police sector. Um, it's so unfortunate that uh, the PPP government, who is uh, backed up largely by Indians, they're not doing anything about it. I'm just wondering what you and I can do, um, the ordinary people out there, again, in terms of like, uh, mobilizing in the community, education, writing reports, gathering statistics. Um, this is a really grave problem. Um, yeah. Um, so um, could you respond to that, please? Well, what we can do, just two weeks ago, I got a call from a historian at the University of Guyana, an African girl, Charmaine uh, Johnson or Jackson, she called me and she's doing research on Indian females in the police force. And she was able to give me some data and I'll come to your question here because it fits in. Um, because this is actual research, Charmaine is doing this minute, that in the 5,000 strong Guyana police force, which is double what we had in Independence, 2,600 then, that there's only at the maximum, there's half of them are African. So interestingly enough, the Guyana police force has gender balance. Half of the four police force are females. However, Charmin told me that only of that, only uh, 500, 10% uh, is of, um, you know, Indian, Indian females. So she, she's looking in a sense at the tougher question why aren't Indian women going in? And it relates to the whole question of Indian females. So what she's coming up is something that Tara and others have been doing. And I, uh, you know, way back we started researching this issue is that because of the historical exclusion from the force, Indians in uh, the, the, the East India Company in India always had Indians uh, you know, as the police. We know that going back to before the British took over from the East India Company. So it wasn't a problem of that. But when they came here, only in one year was there a fair uh, in recruitment of Indians. It was in 1885, uh, I believe. And the, of the 25 Indians who were recruited, they, be, they performed admirably. But the governor of that time, Governor Cartwright said, listen, we got 60,000 Indians on the plantations with these machetes, cutlass, as we call them, and therefore stopped this. And how they stopped it was by introducing what they call physical uh, criteria for measurement, chest measurement, height measurement, uh, you know, on all of that. Our men at that time were basically five feet two. My great grandfather was five two. To be five six, you were a Patan giant at that time. So they excluded us and over the hundreds of years in the Indian community, that is what is called a structural pattern. You begin to accept that that is not your place. You, you are being forced to eat beef and pork and you're, you're, you're posted away from your home. And our men marry early, you're supposed to be single. Our men, you know, uh, my grandfather, I got married at 23, uh, you know, even though I'm an old man now. So. So be a policeman, all those factors uh, militated against you being that. So for women, it was worse. A female going into 
that institution, even today in India, they can get it done. And India is toying with all female stations. Right now, they're experimenting between me and you. There's a good report out on that. So to come back to your question, uh, it is not that the PPP does not necessarily want that. It's a very hard sell. And I have gone through myself personally with my own relative next door, a second cousin lives. His son got seven CXE and I encouraged him to go into the GDF. I said, boy, there's a great future. You'll be trained by the FBI, all of that. After seven weeks, he quit. Why? I said, he said they were treating him like dirt. He, he was treated like nothing. So the, the institutional factors is what militates. So somebody somewhere has to get very granular to actually make sure that these things are done. So it, it is not a simple thing and uh, we shouldn't be pointing fingers. It's a structural problem. So, but your question is what I do as a Hindu activist, as you know, I my standard line to every Hindu young audience that you want to be like Ram, Ram had a bow and arrow in his hands. You get me? The man was fighting. Today you would have had an AK-47. Girl, you want to be like Sita? Sita argued that she had to go with Ram into Banbas, to that kind of thing. Meaning we have to go at the cultural level to let them understand that and try to, and at the macro level, the government will have to ease their part. For example, there are now three training stations in each county. It makes it easier for a Burmese person not to come to Georgetown, which is, as you know, foreign country to them. You know, um, <clears throat> I was just in Guyana, I was there for two months. And I did an unofficial, uh, unscientific research project, mm -hmm. um, just asking Indians, you know, uh, what's preventing you from yes. joining the force? And it was rather quite revealing. Um, they were saying, you know, they have like them dal and rice, you know, and they have like them kuli music, and um, uh, they they feel intimidated by uh, the the people in the police force right now. So if we can just perhaps accommodate uh, Indians you know, uh, with their food, their music, their culture, making them feel comfortable we see, and we see uh, this, have that support system. We see this uh, is what we fought for, Devon, and, and I was able to precipitate. There was a commission of inquiry into the Discipline Force Commission. I presented evidence and part of the evidence is for these things, the, the, the um, recommendation for to be done since 2004. The point is the institution itself, it's not just um, inertia. It has to be conscious for these things not to be done. But with a president like, and you see that, that that's the, the, the stigma that we are seeing as still bound coolly. So for example, one of the most um, emancipatory action is when the president of this country, Irfan Ali, served all of the European delegates food from a leaf, uh, what we call the Purine leaf, the lotus leaf. And they had to mix it with their fingers because he mixed it with their fingers and eat it with their fingers. Do you understand? It is from the leadership, so small as that might be. But when it, just same thing like dancing, when Irfan would go on the stage, you understand? and dance to chutney music, you get me? It is emancipatory. And so it it's not going to be small. Is. Yes, these are small steps, more important steps, but something okay. has to be done. Yes, something. Thank you very much, Mr. Bhagwan. And, um, you know, as we're talking about President Ali, I'm just hoping that it is not that serving food on the leaf and going and dancing chutney that anger the Nigerian, causing him to want to kill the man. That's right. Well, they have yeah. him. He's under. He uh, he hasn't been. Uh, he's been intubated, and they haven't uh, been able to take that out. And so we're waiting for him if he can recover. He got yeah. seven shots, three in the gut, one through the head, and uh, one on each leg. So it's touch and go. But they are working very, very diligently to see if they can get him to talk. Somebody brought him in. Somebody there, brought him. there are lots of Africans coming to Guyana. I know that for a fact. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. All right, thanks. So let's hear from uh, South Africa now, our very good friend, Varendra Singh. Varen, go ahead, um, unmute your mic. You're unmuted, but I'm not hearing you. Hi, can you hear me? Hearing you now, yeah. Just 
Right, I'm seeing you on video too. Good. Hi, everyone. Um, hey, Virendra. Hi. I just like to add a little something to what Marlon Padiachi uh, alluded to. In the 60s and 70s, Indians in South Africa was regarded as the most law-abiding citizens. Later on, as the decades progressed, we were notorious for white-collar crime. And the crime was mainly perpetrated amongst family, uh, land issues, fraud, and so forth. Fast forward to today. Before I make my statement, you must understand that in South Africa, we have courts in all the different provinces. Provinces are dominated by the different races. So I'm going to talk about mainly the Indians in the Durban area. Our courts there. Now, because of my close involvement with everyone in the legal sector, what I'm going to tell you is not even known to most South Africans. Today, when you look at the cases that come to court, the most outrageous and atrocious crime committed, not politically motivated, but socially, are done by Indians. Now, these courts that I'm talking about are located in predominantly Indian and Black areas. You will see absolutely no white, literally no colored uh, defendants appearing. So when I talk to my friends who are judges, and when they tell me about the cases that come to court, it's horrendous what our Indians do. So we always poke fingers at blacks, but currently we are responsible for a lot of it. Now, upon looking closer, we find a lot of the perpetrators are also of Indian and Pakistani origin. South Africa is being infiltrated by a lot of people from these countries, but they are also involved in massive organized crime. So we have the sector of organized crime that's heavily, heavily involved in drugs, but the social issues, the Indians local, we are the main cause of that. I just like to add that. Thank you so much. Sure, and let me just bring in Mr. Marlon Padayachi here to respond to that. Mr. Padayachi, uh, would you like to comment? Yes, I think um, Virendra Singh has um, brought in a very key point um, in present day South Africa, although Indians are marginalized, but uh, they seem so active uh, in that kind of thing, you know, to um, be very predominant in uh, white collar crime, cutting deals, beating the system. And um, if I have to say it, the Guptas of India uh, accentuated uh, the Indianness uh, in this kind of fraud and corruption. So uh, it is a community that's a, it's a shadow of its past, no longer the straight road, but how you can, you can hobnob and uh, be politically uh, connected and get as much as you can, the chase for wealth status, but then you get into the huge, you, uh, the long arm of the law is always there. And um, uh, the f uh, many of them, uh, besides the criminal court in Durban, most of them are appearing across the country, especially in the free state over the Gupta-linked fraud and uh, corruption charges and uh, tender premieres tender rigging, procurement dealings. So yeah, it, it's, a, it's a sad indictment of uh, an Indian community as um, uh, Mr. Dev said, that Gandhi you know, sowed the seeds of liberation here yeah, and um, somebody else uh, asked the question about mobilization. The Indians were very prominent in the anti-apartheid movement. They were progressive, they were on the right side, on the right side of righteousness, even our founding president, Nelson Mandela, uh, had the highest regard, but I think we've lost our way. Well, sad to hear that. Would you be able to say what percentage of those people who are currently in jail are 
Indians from India or South African Indians who came that's from very, the alleged past? That's a very good part. I think it's a, 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 a balance of both. Um, the, the Rendra Singh also, you know, as I mentioned in my uh, overview, the intra-Indian um, violence, and as uh, Mr. Dev pointed out, Indian against Indian, uh, that's, that's quite predominant where uh, that kind of anger is unleashed, that kind of anger and fury is unleashed for a variety of reasons. Indians find themselves economically sidelined. Uh, not everyone makes the, the tender or the procurement deal. So it's, it's like what the Americans say, there's a lot of side hustle going in going here. But the good point uh, by, by, my, by Virendra is that uh, the influx of uh, Pakistani, Bangladeshi and Indian uh, migrant, uh, economic migrants here to the level of buying and selling passports and, um, and sort of infiltrating the OMFS department where uh, you encourage these foreign migrants to intermarry with the black. And that's like an old list of corruption. But the government is fighting back very hard. And uh, that, that section of uh, the economic migrants are also behind bars and more, more to come. All right, thank you for sharing that. We'll take a final question now from Dr. Tara Singh. Welcome, sir. You're still muted. Okay. Um, yeah, um, Raviji has made some very important points and what he said about the findings in Professor Jones is largely applicable to the situation in Guyana. I just came back from Guyana having spent 10 days there, 10 days there. Now, the question of a rep Dr. Tara Singh, you're, you're muted. You may have touched it in error. Still muted. Just click. Yes, right. Okay now. You're okay. okay now. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Rabiji made some very um, telling points about the situation, Gan. And also, I would like to add that there was a study done by Professor David Dodd and Michael Paris. In terms of robbery, they were able to establish through the use of data, uh, ethnic specialization in robbery. And they trace it back to the 60s during the disturbances, the racial disturbances when, when afro guyanese started to attack Indians and beat them and vice, they discovered that Indians carry a lot of jewelry and money on them, especially when they come to the own centers to shop. And that has transformed into robbery with violence after then. So that was, um, people should read it. And Professor McCandless did an excellent, he was a psychiatrist. He did an excellent analysis on the socialization patterns of Indians, where, as Raviji said, Indians were socialized to repress immediate um, aggression. In the process, they tend to show that when they say intrapunity is born to themselves, they commit suicide than the other groups. Today, I can tell you the situation has thrown around. Other groups like Africans are having a similar rate of suicide if you combine the actual suicide with attempts. What is being done in Guyana now, people just look at the suicide, the successful suicide rate and make comparisons that is incomplete. If you look at suicide behavior and combine that across all boundaries, you find that Africans and Indians have the same rate of suicidal behavior in Ghana. That could be traced back to family traditions, etc. But a key point that he made, and this was captured by Leo Depre in his book, Cultural Pluralism and Nationalist Politics in Ghana, where he said, in very simple language, that Indians need money, Africans need money, other groups need money, 
money for different reasons. African Indians need money to save, to build a house, to see that their children are married. Africans, on the other hand, need money for other reasons. Uh, they may want to spend, they may have uh, other article of conspicuous consumption. Now, that is tied into the whole idea of um, Africans being committed to short on heroism and Indians to deport gratification. So that is an important concept to understand the differences between Indians and Africans in terms of the accumulation of wealth. It has great um, implications for that. Now, um, I just want to touch briefly on, it's true that Indians developed a notoriety for wife murders in the, in the plantation system. Reverend Grant, who was a colonial magistrate, stated that wife murders formed the foulest blot in the immigration system in Guyana. And um, that was echoed by Hugh Tink and all these other um, historians subsequently. Finally, um, I want to, there, there's, a, there's a French philosopher named La Cassagne said that crime flourishes in the social medium appropriate to its development and society has the criminal it deserves. Uh, that is something we should really reflect upon, I think, seriously. Since 1886, that statement was made, but we should look at it carefully, analyze it, and see to what extent is still applicable today. Once again, I want to thank um, the two presented, presenters for the excellent, um, I think we should have um, Ravi Dev again, and, and uh, we need somebody from Trinidad because I was, I'll hoard that trade out probably six in, in the line of uh, violent crimes. I, I'm not sure that correctly, but thank you. And um, You're welcome. And yeah. thank you very much for, as always, your presence and your contribution. Mm -hmm. And yes, Trinidad and Tobago at this point in time is seeing its highest murder rate ever. Mm. So we have some situations to deal with, but... Um, it's not linked necessarily to ethnicity, mm. or at least we don't have the data to confirm or deny. So I'm seeing Dr. Mahabir, I was going to bring on Dr. Chaparva now, but I'm seeing Dr. Mahabir would like to say something. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I would be um, very short um, in response to Tara. Yes, we tried very hard to get a speaker from Trinidad. We approached about 20 of them. And there is a, a Center for Criminology Studies at UWE. Um, they responded by saying they um, don't have data. They collect data on ethnicity, but they don't have anything on Indians. So <laughs> they couldn't, uh, they felt they were not capable of speaking. So that's the reason why we do have an Indian representative, but we did try very hard. So it opens a whole gap there that somebody has to factor in Indian, give them a presence. Yes. Is there someone? Is there someone you can get to do a content analysis, uh, looking at newspaper reports and other yeah, reports? Yeah, we're working on that. Mm. But what we suspect, uh, anecdotally, anecdotally, and um, this cursory observation is that um, Indians, uh, uh, majority of victims of home invasions, are Indians. But right now, it's um, gang violence, black on black crime. Of course, sometimes the uh, Indian is collateral damage. Mm. Yeah, that's okay. All right, great. So we've had a very enlightening conversation and I want to thank our speakers very much. This is a, a, a conversation that we would like to have um, explored further and we're hearing the calls for it. We do acknowledge it as well. But I want to bring on now Dr. Sajadeen Chaparvan again. He is the assistant professor in the Center for Diaspora Studies at the Central University of Gujarat in India. And he is here to share some details with you all about an international Indian diaspora conference that his university um, is organizing to take place in February. So welcome Dr. Chaparban, go ahead please. Unmute. I know you're probably bringing up your slides. You're still muted though, right?
And while he's trying to get it started, I want to refer you all to the chat. He has placed the call for papers in the Zoom chat, so all of you all can have access to it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Chaprabhan needs to be unmuted. Ravin, maybe you need to unmute him. And I think he needs to be able to share his screen. Yeah. <clears throat> Ravin. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now it's audible. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I would like to just uh, share the PPT. Yeah, we are seeing your screen. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mahabir and uh, Dr. Shalima and uh, the entire team at uh, Indo-Caribbean Center, uh, Culture Center. I think uh, this is one of the best platform uh, which is connecting. That's what when I was about to speak first time at this platform, so I, I express my personal feeling that uh, the, what this uh, ICC is doing, that trying to connect the Indian scholarship on diaspora and the ongoing wonderful scholarship. There are wonderful scholars who are attached. I was, I think you have seen when I shared my platform screen that I was trying to look at uh, ICC's with different programs that you conducted, you have invited a lot many scholars who are working on this area and you are doing a commendable work. Thank you so much for inviting me. This present conference uh, that we plan, it's an interdisciplinary uh, conference on the global Indian diasporas. We are trying to look at through the cultural, literary and socio-economic perspectives in 21st century. It's in hybrid mode and in collaboration with the uh, various national and international universities, uh, associations, organizations like uh, uh, Assam University, Aligarh Muslim University, Banaras Hindu University, Punjab University, Jaipur University, uh, Central University of Kerala, Central University of Karnataka, Hyderabad University, a lot many universities around uh, 20 institutes are involved in this program. And most of them have contributed uh, academically. So we have received around 400 abstracts so far now. So I'm expecting 100 more abstracts for this conference. So it's not a conference, but it's a series of conferences on various aspects of Indian diaspora. As we try to produce the call for paper in almost 12 languages of India, starting from Punjabi, Kashmiri, Urdu, Hindi, Marathi, Gujarati, Tamil, Uriya, Telugu, Kannada, Hindi, uh, etc. So these were the languages that we tried to cover and, and the important part of this diaspora conference is to look at not the, Indian, let us say Indian diaspora in America or Indian diaspora in Canada or in uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Along with this, this is the dominant scholarship, but the important part of this conference is to look at Indian diasporas through the regional perspective of India, let us say Marathi diaspora, Gujarati diaspora, Kannada diaspora, Malayali diaspora, Punjabi diaspora. Similar, this, this, some, this is something new that we are trying to explore here. As you know that, uh, as you know that culture, identity, language, and literature are social homes wherein we want to reside and if we are forced to migrate voluntarily, involuntarily. We often want to create these social homes away from home. The desire for social home constantly keep us engaged in inclined towards the homes that are left behind and compels us to create these homes away from home. This interesting desire caused by crossing the different socio-cultural setting, be it national or international, leads to the formulating the immigrant minorities or diaspora or diaspora minorities in the host societies. Earlier, it was difficult for international migrants to be connected with their physical home, abstract homes, and also the homeland, but with the advancement of information and communication technology and compression of time and space due to globalization of the down of, of the down of 21st century, 
this has facilitated both the national and transnational migrants to reconnect it, uh, to increase their mobility and create home away from home. So uh, keeping this, you know, the contemporary situation in mind, we try to, you know, organize this conference. And the another purpose of, you know, uh, of this conference to look at the growing cultural, economic, and political importance of Indian diaspora, be it in the form of remittances, be it in the form of cultural diplomacy, be it in the form of soft power, and so on. So we are we we thought of and, and, and this importance, this growing importance has attracted the interest of not only the politicians, policymakers, but also the scholars from humanities and social sciences across disciplines. Therefore, we wanted to host this, you know, huge series of conferences. So if you could see the call for paper that I shared and Dr. Mahabir has shared, I, I think you could see that there is a series of conferences. There are around 23 conferences taking place at a time. For example, starting from the Punjabi diaspora, wherein we Punjabi, Gujarati, Hindi, Urdu, Bengali, Uriya, Malayali, Tamil, Kashmiri, Marathi, Telugu, and Kannada. Uh, and within these, these conferences, we try to look at the history, regional language, uh, and their culture, folk, dance, food, habits, a lot many things are there. I think there is this, uh, I, I, I have shared these slides, uh, also the call for paper. I think the slide is not moving. Is it moving? Yeah. We're yeah, seeing. Yes. Yeah. So we also try to look at minorities in diaspora, be it gender minorities, cultural minorities, linguistic minorities, religious minorities, and the caste in diaspora, languages in diaspora, Indian languages, uh, and the translation of Indian writing in diaspora into various other languages, including English language. Indian cultures, Indian religions, and how the Indian diaspora is, you know, going to benefit through the trade. I think most of the things that we have covered uh, through this uh, conference and the last date to submit abstract that was on 15th of December, but due to various requests that we were receiving, so we extended to 30th December 2022. And uh, the acceptance and reject rejection, we will do it by 10th of January. And uh, the full papers or the, uh, you know, the uh, draft paper is, you know, expected from the scholars by 10th of February. I know it's not possible, but uh, we requested the draft paper, but uh, we will extend the deadline for submitting full paper even after the conference. The reason being after this conference, we are going to bring around uh, 15 edited volume in the series form from the Routledge publishers. So uh, I request all the scholars who are here, who have been working in diaspora, or if you know anyone who is working on Indian diaspora, please ask them to be a part of this conference. If, if they don't want to present paper in the conference, ask them to contribute at least uh, one chapter from uh, your respective country or you know uh, your respective fellow friends who are working on the similar aspect of the themes that are presented here. Uh, this conference is a free of cost. There is no charge that we have, you know, uh, asked. There is no registration fee. There is no publication fee. We wanted to make it, you know, uh, uh, very uh, uh, academic friendly. But yes, there is a, there are, there are certain things which we still required. We, we were looking for funding options from the abroad or in India also. We have approached some of the funding bodies, but uh, so two universities have agreed, but it's a very small amount, uh, around 20,000, 20,000, they agreed to pay to the you know uh, speakers as an honorarium. But I'm expecting, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still in open for various kind of sponsoring bodies if you know any one of them, you can please let us know. We will write to them. Uh, and they, that, that, that's the one thing, uh, one small concern that we have while organizing uh, the conference. Our government has, you know, reduced 
uh, budget. So we are struggling with the finance uh, here at our university and uh, various other universities also have, you know, expressed the same concern. Uh, with this word, if you have any question and comment, uh, please do write to me. This is my email address and uh, I have also shared my mobile number and any time, any suggestion, apart from this finance part, if you have any academic suggestion, if you know any good scholar who is working on this similar area, please let us know. We will write to them. I think I have taken much time. Should I, I think I should stop here and uh, keep open for question and answer session. Thank you so much, Dr. Shalina and Dr. Mahabir and entire team giving me this opportunity to present my this. Uh, this is our event. I'm sorry. Uh, this is our event. Uh, it, it's a collective effort that we are trying to do and please be a part of it. Thank you all. Yeah. Excellent. So there's no issue with the time we set aside today for you. You know that. So we really appreciate your having stayed up so very late. It's now the morning in India. So we want to thank you very much for being here to share all the details that we've not been able to share just by circulating the call for papers. And I think uh, Mr. Devanand Bhagwan has a question for you. Yes, yes, Mr. Bhagwan, go ahead and mute, please. Uh, namaste, uh, Dr. Chaparajan Ji. Um, I am very much interested in uh, um, being part of your conference. Um, I, I just want to let you know I have a doctorate and um, I have a great interest in diaspora. As a matter of fact, I go to India um, approximately every two years. Okay, uh, I love Hindi. My wife is Indian. And I'm mm Hindi -hmm. bolta hu, okay? Hindi is our mother language. So, is why I wanted to go there. If you can accommodate me, that'd be great. Uh, do you have a, a conference at BHU? Yeah, we we do have. Uh, in we are we are also in we are also collaborating with Banaras Hindu University. Uh, there is a professor called uh, Professor Ganesham from History Department. He is uh, coordinating one of the sessions on cultures and religion in Indian, Indian diaspora. Okay, because I'm going to be in Benares um, in, in, uh, in two months. In, in, uh, I'll be there in February. So, yeah. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. It will be a great pleasure for us to invite you, sir. Please uh, just uh, share me share your details with us. So I think we, we will write to you for Madhi, sir. Achha, ji, 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 sir. Thank you so much. I want uh, uh, Dr. Ravi sir and other scholars also who are working in the similar area, please do contribute your paper. I know it will be very difficult for you to present a paper, but I think you can write a scholarly article for our edited volume, sir. All of you, I think most of the seniors professor is here. I could also see Dr. Dara Singh sir and other fellow colleagues here. Can you please give your details again, your uh, email and phone number? Yeah, please, sir. I am just sharing once again, sir. Here uh, it is. Are there any other questions for Dr. Chaparban? Sir, I shared in the chat. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bhagwan, we will also be emailing to you. I think you should have already gotten the call for papers in your email some time ago, but we will be recirculating again this week. Okay. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Chaparban. And I just want to remind you all, this conference is indeed taking place in February, Dr. Chaparban, to 23rd to the 25th. 23rd, yes. 24th and 25th of February. February 23rd, 24th and 25th, both in person and in hybrid mode. So if you are unable to go to India to present your paper, you will be able to do so online. Yeah. And all those details will be shared with you. So thanks again for being here, Dr. Chaparban, and um, we will chat soon. Thank you. Sure. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all. I want to thank our speakers, Mr. Marlon Padachi and Mr. Ravi Day for contributing to today's topic so well. And um, to all our participants, thank you so much for being with us. Let's uh, bring today's session to a close and I'll now hand you over to Shakira. Hey, thank you, everyone.
Thank you for taking the time to participate and thanks especially to the speakers. As I've said before, this public meeting is being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center. And you can feel free to contact the ICC to publish your books and your reports. Remember that we are asking you to kindly give us your suggestions as well as donations. And you can contact Dr. Kumar Mahabir for details. Thanks to the advisory and planning team led by Dr. Kumar Mahabir. And thank you also to our IT manager behind the scenes, Robin Ram Singh, who has been recording the program and will edit and upload it to our YouTube website permanently for posterity. Our topic next Sunday, which is Christmas Day, and I saw someone was asking that question, will be melodies from the Indian diaspora. So please visit our channel on YouTube to see all our past recordings. I am Shakira Mohammed of Trinidad and Tobago saying goodbye. May God bless you all. Danyabad. Thanks everybody for attending. So on Christmas Day, we'll be here and we have lovely music live and recorded, but we'll continue. We do, we want to continue the tradition, not to skip a single Sunday. Where is Diwali E Christmas? We are right there. Okay, anybody, Chaparban uh, doctor, welcome. It must be about 2 a.m. in India now, about that. 2.20, sir. To thank you very much for the sacrifice. Uh, in between, yeah. I was also feeling sleepy, so I used to turn off turn off the video and I, <laughs> I used to turn it on. Okay. But thank you so much. It was really I listened to both uh, the scholars and the interventions by Doctor Bhagwan, Doctor Tara Singh, and other and your intervention. Of course, we know your scholarship and you have been doing a wonderful work. Huh. Sir, my personal request to you is that uh, uh, please uh, do share this call with the sure. scholar who are in touch with you. Yes, I think yes. you have. I, I think when I just opened, I was just going through the you know uh, uh, some of the events that you conducted in past. So the, you have invited scholars. You have done a wonderful work in this <laughs> yes. area. Yes. And, and the problem, if I think, uh, I, I think. The book, the, the book which is coming, uh, which you are also a part of it on the, you know, Grimitia literature. Yeah. I think very less scholars from this particular region, the Caribbean countries become part of, you know, uh, Indian academic uh, uh, endeavors. Yeah. So I think we are collaborating with you. So you take up this, uh, you know, a small request from us to, you Thank know, you. invite these scholars to be a part of this academic collective endeavor. And we have a scholar here, um, uh, one of the many, Dr. Sita Shah, who has the cover of her new book. I am sure, Sita, would you be yeah, interested Sita. in presenting virtually? You can probably help promote your book in February. Wonderful. Would you want to unmute? Okay, she probably stepped away. Yeah, okay. well, I have to wait. I'm now, I've now been unmuted. Right, right. Okay. So, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Oh, we would like you to um, uh, present or promote your book at the conference in February, virtual or in person, um, okay. Gujarat University in India, so February. That sounds okay. like such a good 